tiny volcanic island in the Western Pacific. This was the top secret launch pad for the atomic bombs that ended the Second World War. America dropped Fat Man and Little Boy on Japan, and they had secret plans for dozens more. Dad, check this out. A present-day Los Alamos bomb maker believes that when the war ended, the parts for those A-bombs were dumped here. These pieces ended the darkest time in human history. They're out there, somewhere. Now, for the first time, a hunt is on to find them. I think I found a bomb. Father and son diver explorers Mike and Warren Fletcher search for components from the bomb that changed the world. Oh, Glenn McDuff is a nuclear physicist and bomb builder. He spent decades tracking down secret documents, photographs, and first-hand accounts of the men who made the atomic bombs that were dropped on Japan. And he believes that when the war ended, components for many more bombs were left behind. Someone didn't get the memo about dumping items that wage war over the ocean. And that's what got me interested in coming to look here. There were 66 fat mans on Tinian at the end of the war. Are they out there? They're out there. Are we looking for a needle in a haystack? Probably. The Fletchers can see the size of the task ahead of them, a land and sea search for scattered A-bomb parts. The hunt for the atomic bomb is not like anything we've ever done before. It's, it's an obscure target. We know that there could very well be pieces, especially a fat man, out here in these waters. Tinian is nearly 2,500 kilometers from Japan. Underwater volcanoes and deep chasms in the seabed surround the island. Today, sport divers consider the region one of the best dive sites on the planet. But in 1945, it was the site of the busiest airport in the world. Tinian was the launch pad in the fight against Japan. The island was home to Project Alberta, a top-secret operation that built the first atomic weapons used in combat. The American commanders wanted Project Alberta to run like a factory. Each month, three atomic bombs could be assembled and dropped until Japan surrendered. On August the 6th, 1945, Little Boy was dropped on Hiroshima. Three days later, Fat Man destroyed much of Nagasaki. Another atomic bomb was nearly ready to go with more waiting in the wings, but Japan chose surrender over annihilation. Today, not a single first-generation bomb survives. The team want to find the Fat Man casings and bomb components that were left behind. A direct connection to the original atomic weapons and the scientists at Project Alberta. The discovery that would make history. How many times have you been on the island? First time. Really? Never. We're here with Glenn to uh, try and understand the importance of this island um, as a staging point of the dropping of the bomb that changed the world. There's a connection between this island and that event that's lost here in the jungle and here offshore. So if we, if we stumble onto something, you're going to know what we got our hands on? I hope so. Project Alberta brought 270 tons of equipment. So For Glenn, the quest to find a piece of the original A-bomb is a scientific holy grail. He's convinced the material can still be found. The search begins on Tinian's abandoned aircraft runways. This is where Fat Man and Little Boy began their fateful journeys to Japan. Bomb loading pits are still here. This did make world wars obsolete. It, it, it made wars not worth fighting anymore. And the, you know, the horror that led up to this, that, that we actually had to do something like this to stop, to, to, to end a world war. That's kind of awe-inspiring. The atomic bombs comprised hundreds of parts that were brought to the island for assembly. But when the war ended, those bomb components just disappeared. The official U.S. military records state that the U.S. Army Air Forces dumped all top-secret A-bomb material up to 16 kilometers offshore in water up to 2 kilometers deep. 
Tinian lies near the deepest point in the world's oceans, the Mariana Trench, a yawning fissure 11 kilometers deep. The seabed starts to drop dramatically less than five kilometers offshore. Anything dumped here would likely never be found. But Glenn believes the official records are wrong. His research suggests that American military personnel simply moved the components for the bombs from somewhere near the airfield to the coast and dumped them in the shallow waters off this part of the island. The team looked for a coastal point near the runways. This has got to be a gutter for runway A. Yeah. Yes, drainage or maybe sewer. Drainage, or because in a typhoon, it's a oh, lot yeah. of water, they got to get off that runway. Yeah. The other thing is, if they bulldozed all the way to the ocean, for this trench. This might be a dump area. Yeah. Let's go take a look. An access road appears to lead directly from runway A to the ocean. Why don't you take a waypoint, Warb? Yeah. Maybe we can consider coming back to dive and see what's off the end of this roadway. The ultimate thing here would be to find uh, one of the Fat Man weapons cases. Fat Man is, he, you know, that's the granddaddy of all the bombs. The Fletchers intend to dive just offshore close to the island's runways. They're looking for anything connected with the atomic bomb. Components or casings, technological remnants of man's most terrible weapons. Their search is the first of its kind. Gwen really knows and understands not just the history of, of these events, but he understands the math and the physics that makes them work. Glenn dives too. Mike and Warren need his expertise to identify any bomb parts they discover. The dive takes them down 50 meters. Mike and Warren are using communication-enabled masks so they can alert each other to any finds. The first things they see are large, jagged rock formations and a sea bottom teeming with marine life. What the heck is that thing? Some kind of crazy starfish, obviously. I would not want to step on that. Mike is puzzled by some of the large shapes he sees. Just keep looking, you'll start to see the odd one here or there. They look like man-made objects encrusted in coral. Yeah, up there on that ridge on the right, I think I should see one. Definitely some kind of wreckage over here. They need Glenn's expert eye. But the team must be careful. Tinian was a strategic base in World War II and heavily fought over. Live bombs and shells still litter the ocean floor. Glenn has studied the dimensions of each of the hundreds of components that make up an A-bomb. As time ticks away, he examines the object, hoping for a match. Back to the boat. I'm getting pretty low on air. What would you think? I think those are Sherman tank rounds. I think they're 70 millimeters. They all measure at the base right at three inches. Well, obviously not uh, nuclear bomb pieces. No, I think this was a, an amphibious assault beach. So maybe that mark in the ground that we saw was just where the landing crafts were coming ashore. Tinian came under heavy shelling when American forces took the island from the Japanese in July 1944. The site was chosen for Project Alberta. And the following year, atomic bombs left Tinian targeted on Japan. But it looks likely that the runway road the team found was used to carry materials onto the island, not off it. They still need to find the dump site. But the amount of live shells and munitions they've already seen underwater has given them pause for thought. Unexploded ordnance is still down there. You might just find the one, but one ordnance that still has a fuse, still has a timer, still has a detonator. 
Hey, if using my luck goes, I'd find it. Before investigating further, they seek expert advice from the local bomb disposal unit on the dangers they face diving here. What we're doing is taking all of the ordnance that's been collected from um, a large ordnance storage depot that burned back in 1945, and we've been cleaning it up over the last couple of months. So let's go take a look at the hole. Weapons left behind from the Second World War litter Tinian in nearby islands. Live shells and grenades scatter the landscape, and munitions experts dealing with them are fighting fire with fire. Basically, you look over here, you can see we got you know, some ordnance, and uh, basically we just put the C4 on top of the ordnance, and then uh, we initiate the C4. When the C4 uh, detonates, then uh, the ordnance disappears. The concept here is that all of the World War II ordnance still contains very viable uh, explosive content. So by adding the modern era explosives with it, we're counting on a contribution from the old stuff and the idea is to get it all go at the same time. And when we're done, there shouldn't be anything left in the hole. I, I'd get really nervous if I noticed you look nervous. <laughs> How much corrosion there is on these things is always a factor of whether they're exposed to water, whether they're exposed to the air, etc. Well, one of the ones that we found was still in its shipping tube and the cardboard tar had protected it perfectly. So it is in perfect museum condition. I can show it to you if you want to see it. Here it is. Wow. This. That's amazing. That is exactly the same as everything else that's in that hole, but you see how corroded everything else is. This one, the tube, that the storage tube that it was in, protected it perfectly. And are these the types of things that we might find out in the ocean? Do you recover this stuff from the ocean a lot? Five-inch projectile? Absolutely. Yeah. Anything that was fired in that type of scenario, or Japanese rounds fired at the Marines when they were coming in, so you're going to find that out there in the, uh, in the reef. One of the biggest things that we run into these days is white phosphorus, which will catch on fire in the presence of oxygen. People will pull it out of the ocean because it looks like a white piece of china until you get it in the air. Yeah. And then yeah. the oxygen gets to it and it starts smoking. And next thing you know, the guy's got this in his BC or his, <laughs> or his wetsuit, catches on fire. Did you guys find any of that? Jump back in the water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and right, where we just came from, right at the very top of that cliff up there, that's about a mile and a half away. When we blow this, we're going to do it from up there. So here is where you're going to see it all put together. Up there is where you're going to see it go boom. There is enough TNT to level a 10-story building. Burn hole! The cliff top is a safe vantage point, but an underwater encounter with a live shell could be fatal for the team. Planes carrying the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki departed from the Tinian airfield. The team know the bombs were assembled and stored somewhere nearby. They need to locate the top secret site of Project Alberta. Then they can work out whether surplus A-bomb parts may have been dumped when Japan surrendered. It's a challenge. At the end of the war, the US military ceded this entire area, obscuring the secret base. After more than 60 years, thick foliage covers the site and the tropical heat makes searching uncomfortable. They use Glenn's photos of the base from 1945. They look back in time to locate the key buildings known as Quonset Huts. We obviously got to go that back that we way. Go back. The, hey. Hey, here. Oh, yeah. A Quonset Hut bolt. So how can you tell that's a Quonset Hut bolt? The corrugated covering would bolt to a rib which is about a two inch channel and uh, there's the rubber gasket for water sealing oh yeah they would they just bolt it down in a clearing the team find the crumbling foundations of a prefabricated building they're on the right track it's the edge of concrete this is the first quonset hut we put one of these closest to the road. Yeah, some of the bigger ones, but we're looking for the smaller ones in the back corner, right? Yep, that's the technical area. So we're on the edge of Project Alberta. Yeah. And only people who were working on the atomic bomb were allowed into the yeah into that the, area. This this was a, a, a closed area. The secrecy was of utmost importance. More than fifty scientists worked on Project Alberta. Known as the Destination Team, the operation was protected by armed guard. 
Despite the smiles, these were men under pressure. They were assembling the first atomic bombs to be used in combat. Bombs intended to kill tens of thousands of people, but that would end the war. We should hit some, probably some remnants of the next fence and then the next quantity hunt. Yeah, should be no problem from here. The photographs give the team a perspective on the past. Look at this. Look at this crack, this chip out of the concrete. It's right there. And just in front of it, there's the scene. <laughs> there's the scene. So that's this is Quonset Hut 4. In fact, if we hold up this picture, that's what we're looking at right there. You know all these guys, what did they actually do? They built and developed the blast measurements for the combat mission. So they could measure the intensity of the blast? Yeah, so they could measure the yield for Little Boy. And this is the, the blast gauge that they used on the Hiroshima mission. And what happened to all the different components and tools and buildings and everything that used to stand here? All this was dumped. The question is where? The team needs someone to interpret their findings and help guide their search. They turn to Project Alberta's unofficial photographer. Los Alamos, New Mexico. Birthplace of the atomic bomb. Only a handful of Project Alberta scientists survive. Leon Smith is one of them. In 1945, he was a 25-year-old atomic scientist working on a top-secret project on Tinian. Can you tell us about your job on Tinian? There were five of us to work on the development and the combat assembly and delivery of the little boy and the fat man. We were expected to be able to test any of the components, repair them, do special things like set the uh, altitude on the radars. Then three of us were to be able to fly with the bombs and to check them out using equipment which I had designed hmm. up to the moment of release. Leon did not get to accompany his bomb on its lethal journey. He lost out to a fellow scientist in a coin toss for the Hiroshima mission. In his downtime, he was the project's unofficial photographer, an insider with access to all areas. After the war, he was stationed on Tinian for a further two months, and he has information on where the bomb parts may have been dumped. I have heard that for explosives and other things, they were expected to go several miles west uh, and drop it. But people in a hurry will often take shortcuts. And at that time, we were accustomed to taking a lot of shortcuts. So we're talking about big volumes of material here. Yeah, uh -huh. it's very large. There was one point of land on the west side of Tinian where after the war, I observed truckloads of, in, of equipment just being pushed over the cliff into the ocean. Leon described the tipping point. Now Glenn and Warren must try to match their photos to a location. The map from 1945 called this Falbus Point. The cliffs at Faber San Hilo Point saw 20 meters above the waves. They create a bulging overhang the locals have nicknamed Dump Cove. At the end of the war, general military debris was dumped here. But Leon Smith believes this was also the trash can for atomic bomb parts. Oh man, this would be the perfect spot to dump stuff off. Yeah. Nice flat approach. It's got to be 50 feet at least. Here it looks like the spot here in your photo. It, and it looked like it hasn't changed much. Man, that would have been a busy spot the last few weeks, just truck after truck, truck coming. Truck after truck. This is definitely a, the dive target. Oh yeah, we have to dive here, there's no question. We could find a casing that looks just like the original Fat Man uh, bomb. Probably, probably in the pieces, in one of the three pieces, but okay. tails, front hemis, back hemis, nose pieces, but yeah, right. sure. or any combination. Wouldn't that be something to find that? That would, that would be a real find. The team planned to look for bomb casings, as well as the bomb's smaller internal components that helped trigger the atomic blast but metal can be hard to recognize after 64 years in the ocean, corroded by salt water and disguised by coral. It's going to be a challenge to spot the parts they want to find. Look for, look for any big, big round things, big plate. 
Any big square boxes, that's always good. They're out there, somewhere. Just waiting for somebody to find them. The team define an initial search area that's roughly 10 square kilometers. I guess is that if Fat Man's there, we're going to find him offshore. So now we have to find a way to get into deeper water and cover as much ground under the sea as we can. We've got to cover a lot of real estate to try and see if we can find evidence of Fat Man. And we think he's out there somewhere. Mike and boat captain Brady Barano devise a plan to speed up their survey. To cover more area today, guys, I want to um, talk to Brady and see about getting him to actually pull me with a rope. And I'll hang on to maybe his anchor. And that way he can use his GPS. He can map where he's towing me. I can stay in 10, 15 meters of water, cover a huge area, and you guys can continue to scout. But what I want to do is basically a reconnaissance. And I'll come yeah. back and report to you what I found. The waters here are clear to around 60 meters, but the ocean rewards them as soon as they dive in. A massive World War II dumping ground stretches as far as they can see, just 15 meters below the surface. Tank parts, engines from planes, and shattered jeeps litter the aquatic landscape. And as they get closer, they spot smaller wartime objects patterning the coral seabed. Glenn finds a metal box that he thinks could be electronic, potentially an internal piece of the bomb. But Coral cements it to the ocean floor. He can't pry it free. Glenn's box looks like it could be electrical equipment, but we just can't budge it. It's now literally part of the ocean environment. Glenn knows what each of the bomb components look like and ultimately rules this out as a piece of the bomb. As the search continues, they find large amounts of live shells and conventional unexploded bombs. Having seen the damage they can cause, the team keep their hands off anything that could still be live ordnance. And Glenn discovers something potentially more dangerous, phosphorus left over from incendiary bombs. It looks like harmless coral and is safe to handle underwater, but this dangerous chemical bursts into flames on contact with air. Mike surveys the seabed from a safer distance as he completes his toe scan. Uh, everything's good, Brady. The seabed is literally lined with all sorts of evidence of the Second World War old jeeps and broken airplane parts and, and office supplies that were here on the island and just bulldozed into the sea. As soon as you hit the water and look down, you're flabbergasted. There is stuff everywhere. This is the first official search for Avon parts in these waters. Glenn has been tracking this story for decades, and he is like a child in a candy shop. He can't drag himself away. I have double tanks on. He's just in there with a single 80 cubic foot tank, and I was amazed at how long he stayed underwater. The guy breathes like a turtle. It's unbelievable. And I think he was just so into it. He was really, you know, controlling his breathing and just, you know, he wanted to stay in there as long as he could. And I kept looking at his gauge, and it was getting lower and lower. And I'd ask him if he wanted to go up, and he'd be like, no, I want to stay down. How much air do you have left? I thought I was going to drag, have to drag you off the bottom well, there. I can tell well, you I don't want to go. I think I'm just going to suck, almost suck this one dry. <laughs> There's much stuff to look. You could look for decades down there. I'm sure you could. I can't believe all the stuff down there. It's everywhere, airplane engines and tanks and old Jeep chassis. But yeah, it's just everywhere you look, like forever. And, like, and every stop. little divot, wash the sand out of it, there's something in every little hole. So what about the bomb casings? I mean, we didn't see it today. but We didn't see anything, but how far is the stuff? I, every time I'd go to a new spot, I'd see something else. I'd go out there, and still you'd see more stuff in the more background. Stuff and more stuff. Yeah. But Mike has something to report that could top their ocean floor experience. I think I found a bomb. Bomb? 
I thought it might even be a little boy because it's kind of the right shape with the tail and the back assembly broken off. I'd like to take you guys and have a look. The atomic bomb codenamed Little Boy was dropped on Japan August 6, 1945. The force of its explosion equaling more than 12,000 tons of TNT. Three days later, Fat Man blasted Nagasaki with the equivalent of 18,000 tons. The scientists' focus was on the bigger bomb, so they believe most of the components dumped here would be parts of Fat Man. A Little Boy casing would be a remarkable discovery. Daylight is fading as Mike leads the team to his target. Have you guys located it yet? Okay, we're, we're over top of it now. The original Little Boy bomb weighed 4,400 kilograms and was three meters long. Mike's target is missing the tail fin the length is very close. Glenn checks the diameter. The original was 71 centimeters across. Warren, let's see if we can get Glenn's attention. Oh no, he's looking at me like this isn't it. No, he doesn't think it's Little Boy. I really thought we had something. I really did. It's a disappointing end to a long, hard day of diving. The object is not part of Little Boy. It could be a standard high-explosive bomb, the type American B-29 bombers dropped on Tokyo, Yokohama, and Osaka. The next day, the hunt starts over at Dump Cove. Again, the team support boat tows Mike across the search area, and once more, a large shape on the seabed catches his eye. Bombs litter the ocean floor around Tinian, but sometimes the planes transporting them ended up there too. Well, I think I found components of an entire plane. The island was based for a fleet of B-29 bombers, and 15 of them were very special, modified to carry atomic bombs. These planes were called silver plates. Each one was adapted to transport and power the A-bomb. And they were fitted with special radar to ensure the bomb's accuracy. These planes have unusual propellers. All four had variable pitch. This meant they could propel the plane backwards, reversing it over deep pits where the A-bombs were ready to load. Glenn, do you have that picture of yeah. the B-29? Yeah, I mean, grab it right here. Yeah, here's the, the close-up of, of them starting wow. a silver plate. You have these two two-man crews, which you just rotate around and <laughs> uh, essentially kickstart the engine. And if we find a hub with the blades on it and it's variable pitch yeah. and it's the right size, yeah. then it's a silver plate, plate, which is a specific B-29 that was used to carry the bomb, right? Yeah. And I remember March of 1945, on the takeoff for one mission, five planes going from west to east in its prevailing wind went into the ocean uh, a little ways off the island. Five planes in one mission? Yes. That was on takeoff? Yes. The planes were very heavily loaded. They'd have lots of traditional style bombs and fuel on board for the bombardment of uh, Japan. Correct. The planes were very heavily loaded and if they went in the water, they just went down. The Silver Plate B-29 bombers did a number of dummy runs before that first nuclear attack on Japan. Mike wonders if the plane he spotted could be a Silver Plate that might have an A-bomb casing on board. There are no official records that a Silver Plate crashed here, but Glenn is still keen to investigate the target. It sure looks like an airplane. There's a lot of stuff here. They can see the aircraft's landing gear and sections of its frame. But the evidence is scattered. The wings, engines, and pieces of fuselage are spread out over a 60-meter radius, and there's no sign of the propellers. And I'm gonna take off. 
off over here. I want to show you the wing. The ocean floor has absorbed the plane's wings, creating a skeletal refuge for underwater life. Then Glenn finds something promising. A propeller, masked by decades of coral growth and corrosion. He probes for clues and can see that the blades are bent. It means the prop was probably turning when the bomber crashed. It's a B-29. But is it a silver plate? Glenn said no. He says uh, he doesn't think it is a silver plate. The telltale sign of a B-29 adapted for atomic warfare is the propeller hubs which allow for changing the pitch. And Glenn can see that this one does not have variable pitch. Another long day of diving ends without a breakthrough. But the sheer volume of potential targets provides hope that tomorrow's dive will be successful. Fat Man has proved to be quite elusive. I have dove on a lot of targets that I thought might lead to, to uh, Fat Man. I've been disappointed more than once now but I'm going to stay with the plan and uh, see if we can't make history by finding what would be one of the last bits and pieces of this important bomb, the Fat Man. At first light, the team return to continue their search of Dump Cove. They have no choice but to push their investigation to the outer edge of the target area, beyond which the seabed quickly drops to more than 400 meters, too deep to dive. These waters border the deepest in the world. Anything dumped there may never be found. Glenn heads off alone to investigate the uneven seabed. A large cylinder sitting alone away from the rest of the war debris attracts his attention. Its size and shape suggest it could be the casing for a fat man bomb. I was swimming off, I'm like, I was looking around, I'm like, what's that big pimple looking thing on the bottom? <laughs> you know, if you look around, there's not another one like it no, anywhere. No. So I swam up over it, and half of the circumference is perfectly round. Right. Which is really odd, and it? but it's really encrusted, so I went, swam down to look at it, but it's hollow. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is hollow. When it was almost the right size to be a fat man. Yeah. Like once you add the crustacean. Yeah, I measured it and uh, it's a little over five feet. The fat man was five foot diameter. It's the right shape, it's the right size, it's the right location. This looks very suspicious. Hey, maybe we have something here. If the target is the casing from a fat man, its discovery will make history. So what do you want to do here, guys? We'll go to the Fat Man target. Yeah. We're going to chisel a little of the sea scum off that bottom lip that's exposed. Okay. And we're going to expose enough just to be sure what it's made of. Right, where the, where the big lip where you can reach inside. Right. There's a really good exposed lip. Okay, so will you actually be tapping off the marine growth on the inside or outside? All outside. If it is a fat man, there's got to be seams on that cylindrical part, right? Yeah, there'll be a seam about three foot up from the bottom. The fat man bombs were notorious for tumbling through the air, though, so who knows? It could have hit the water or even the land on a funny angle, broken in half. We're not going to figure out what it is standing here on yeah. the deck. We need to get in there and figure it out. On his first encounter, Glenn saw the object was hollow, so there is no danger of explosion. Having gained permission from the local government, he chips away at the coral, looking for clues to its genesis. But even a hatchet and hammer can't get through the tough coral growth. 
It almost looks like it has to be some kind of a steel shell. Looks like he's not sure what we've got here. The mystery is proving tough to crack. Their breathing mix is running low, so they are forced to surface. You know, uh, well, it's just a lot off that bottom lip, but it was still all, you know, growth. Plus, when I hit on it, you hear it when you hit it with the hammer? It was tinging. So do you think there is steel under there somewhere? Could be. That growth is thick. So um, how do you rate it? I don't know. We get the metal detector. It's in the right place. It's the right time. Right size and shape. Right size and shape. But is there steel under the object's coral coat? I'm gonna go get the metal detector, okay? Glenn and Mike take turns to use the metal detector. They calibrate it by monitoring their metal air tanks. they struggle to get a reading from the object. Eventually they give up. Looks like it's Carl after all. Nothing. No beep, no hum. There's no metal inside the clump that, for a while, had us going. It was pretty tough to take, you know, it was this big up and down kind of it might be the bomb. I don't think it's the bomb. It's, it really looks like the bomb, and now we know for sure it wasn't. I want to find this bomb, and um, I, I believe from, from looking at the evidence that there is a fat man out there, I'd love to be one of the three or four people working together that could say we found it. And I know that we just have to keep looking. It's if it were easy, it would have already been found. We know it hasn't. Do we believe it's there? Yes. And uh, today wasn't our day. After another day of disappointment, the team review their entire search plan. And are those fuel tanks? You know, here at Dump Co, there's just, there's kind of two, two problems. One, it's, there's so much to look at, and we're limited in, in bottom time. There's a lot in the deep water, and the fact that, that it's cemented under how many feet of, of uh, sea growth. Yeah, there could be big bomb casings completely covered over and buried under that coral. And You can see there's four or five feet of parts in the bottom, all encrusted. And the challenges of the undersea search have proved greater than anticipated. Mike proposes a radical change in their approach. So, I'm getting the impression we should go out of the water and back on shore. Back on land. I think that's our best option. We found a few things there the other day. They haven't found any parts where the bombs were dumped, so they shift their search to where the bombs were assembled. And, and probably the best is, would be the work area, quantified area, because all the piece components were built in the work area. They were all taken to the assembly building and all put into a bomb, so essentially parts go in a bomb comes out. Right. That's where all the bits and pieces are. The bombs known as Fat Man and Little Boy comprised hundreds of components, each one essential for the atomic chain reaction. And the team know the exact location where those parts were put together, the prefabricated huts that made up Project Alberta. They take to the air to examine the compound. A bird's eye view that helps pinpoint Quonset huts two and three. These were the arming and firing stations where Leon Smith helped assemble his bomb. At ground level, it's more of a challenge. The outlines of buildings are harder to spot. 
The undergrowth is thick and many of the bomb parts were small. But the team persevere in the hope of discovery. Did you say these round holes were the toilets, the latrines? Yep, they have to look. So I'm looking in the toilet and look what I found. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Oh. Well, also, if the light bulb burned out in the can, they'd probably just drop it down in there. You think they just threw it away? Yeah. Well, are you going to go after and get it? No, but yeah. do you think you'd want to throw it in the toilet? Why not? Oh, these are outhouses. This is. Everything was au naturel. That, that's a 64 year old light bulb. Yep, we'll leave it for another generation to find. As they press further into the compound, the heat grows more intense. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Yeah, yeah, come on over. The shift from a sea to land search looks like it's about to pay off. Nuclear scientist Glenn McDuff has found a piece of equipment that helped ensure Fat Man and Little Boy detonated at the right altitude above the ground. Looks like it's a cavity tuning meter. This will be hooked to the radar unit. The bomb's four radar units were used to measure the distance to the ground as the bomb fell. When the radar determined that the bomb had reached ground zero, the height above the ground designated for explosion, it would trigger the detonation process. So this is for setting the frequency that we're actually on the bombs? The bombs, they tuned each radar separately so that nobody knew what the frequencies were. In case the enemy wanted to jam, they didn't know what frequencies to jam. Uh, it's possible that this particular unit was used to set the frequency on Fat Man. And Little Boy, both. It's in the right location. This is where they did in this quantum hut. Well, it says a lot about the disposal of everything here on this, at uh, Project Alberta. Yeah, and after being around here, you can kind of tell, wouldn't you be ready to get out of here? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm ready to call it the end of a day, let alone the end of a war. <laughs> oh, here's something, Glenn. Here's something. Yeah, it's a good electrical insulator. Oh, really? Oh, and some connectors or something right here, too. Oh, yeah. Let's see. Now, these are electrical connectors here. Yeah. These Dad, are... check this out. What do you think they are? These are... Electrical insulators? No, no. they're connectors. No, these kind. are little amphenol connectors. Yeah, but again, we're in one of the Army firing and fusing huts. So, these are probably... Oh, yeah. That's a multi-pin connector. This is probably, these are probably out of the clock box. The, on top of the bombs where he had all the pull-out wires. So when it dropped, it pulled these wires and it started all the functions. So these would actually be parts of the bomb? Yeah. This is a big discovery for the team. A vital component and critical link in the bomb's deadly chain reaction. It was a part that gave life to death. This is really significant. These were components that would have been used in future weapons. These components would, may very likely, the one we picked up could have been dropped on Japan on August 24th, which was the next scheduled bomb drop. These are the spares. Notice these have never been used. Oh, okay, the wires would get soldered in here. Would get soldered in there. I see. But these are spares because they were planning on building a lot of bombs. This is where they were built in this hut right here. This is the arteries of the bomb. Right. Mm -hmm. And we'd have never found these underwater, even if they were dumped in the cove. They would be rusted away or buried and concreted over with coral. These are the pieces that ended the darkest time in human history. This is what did it. These simple little parts. The team take news of their find to Leon Smith one of the few surviving scientists who assembled the atomic bombs on Tinian. Hey, Leon. Oh, Glenn. Hey. <laughs> so nice to see you. Hey, how you doing? Up in the, the, main five, the main work area where the quantum huts were, there's still an awful lot of debris left around. We found components left over, and especially these connectors. These are clearly the type of connectors that were used in the electrical systems for both the little boy and the fat man, both on the firing set. 
and the fusing system. Every one of these, every wire, every connection was important. It takes me back to a very exciting point in time in my life. We were doing almost impossible things in times that you would you would now regard as impossible. We made things happen. take a handful of metal and destroy a city with it. Maybe we shouldn't forget what these people did because if we do forget, it's very likely we'll repeat history. And this is not one part of history anyone wants to repeat. And, and after all these years, do you think about the bomb and the effect it had and the impact of the bomb? The battle for Japan was scheduled for November 1 of 1945, just a few months into the future. I think the Japanese would have gone underground into guerrilla warfare. Casualties on both sides would have been simply unreal. How many deaths would you be willing to accept? How did I feel when the bomb was dropped on Hiroshima? I felt a sense of relief. <laughs>